smarter and better in many ways than I am, but I'm the next best substitute. Can I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land in which we meet today, the, the Turrbal and the Yagara people, and also to acknowledge the, the role that traditional owners have played throughout time and throughout Queensland in terms of securing the reefs and the marine environments that we are now uh, blessed to have uh, in Queensland uh, particularly. Uh, just to explain Andrea's absence, uh, she lost her voice uh, yesterday and she's at home today trying desperately to find it and so far no luck. Um, just a few observations about uh, the gathering uh, here today. Um, I was gobsmacked by the quality of the science and the presentation yesterday. It's astounding to, to be, uh, I guess, uh, hear firsthand some of the insights into the way in which coral reefs and associated marine environments operate. Uh, I was particularly interested to hear about uh, clownfish and how they are, they are um, deliberately avoiding the smell of their parents. And it must be nature versus nurture because my kids are the same. <laughs> the, uh, there's, there's also, um, I guess, a, a great uh, notion of, of theory and practice. And one of the few things that I remember from university days is this quote from Rappaport and Rappaport that action without theory is blind and theory without action is wasted. Action without theory is blind and theory without action is wasted. And I think that gatherings such as this are a fantastic way to marry the thinking and the doing in relation to marine conservation. And so my hat, if I wore one, would go off to Terry and the crew for organising this session over the last couple of days. It's been, been a fantastic investment. Um, I think never before have we faced such challenges as we do today, but also never before have we been so well off in terms of the expertise and the understanding that we have at our disposal to better manage the marine environments that uh, are, in, are in our responsibilities. Uh, there was a saying that, that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, and the second best time is today. And I think it's true too with marine management, that there are many things perhaps we could have or should have done years ago, but didn't do, and we shouldn't lament that lost opportunity. I think we should just use it to galvanise our resolve to now take action today to make the action to, to preserve and protect the reefs that are our responsibility. Uh, can also just say it's great to see in the audience here today a mixture of uh, uh, weathered, worn and experienced faces and the bright, fresh faces of youth who are coming through to replace the experts in the field of marine management. It's great to have such a diverse gathering of people as well. In the time available, I was just keen to skate across the contribution that the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, as part of the Queensland Government, makes to uh, marine conservation more broadly and to coral reef uh, environments particularly. I wanted to start by talking a bit about the notion of uh, resilience-based management and then just walk through a few examples that you'll find in Queensland that will help understand the contribution that Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service plays to ensuring long-term survival for these reef communities particularly. So we have... Yeah. There we go. Can I begin by just putting things into context that we don't manage reefs in isolation and we see a very strong connection between all environments within the marine context. And our, our guidance or our, our management is very much guided by this notion of resilience management. For me it's a bit like the experience of the kids jumping on a trampoline. All of these elements woven together to form the mat of the trampoline that would actually provide a cushion when you're falling down and provide spring to bounce back again. And I think when we weave together the elements of regulation, of fisheries management, uh, water quality protection, research, field management, and those elements, we can start to weave a very complex but strong safety net for reef environments. If that net is woven properly, it will provide a very strong base on which reefs can rebound from natural and man-made stresses. If we see it fragment, we run the risk of having perhaps one or two lines of, of insurance that's available to us. When you only have one or two lines, it's a tightrope rather than a trampoline, and there's very little resilience that we can actually offer in the reef environment. The, the elements I mentioned there in the, re in the resilience model are very much related to our relationship with in the GBR, with this Joint State Commonwealth Management, but they hold true for, I think, any reef management or environment across the world. The elements may differ because of the cultural context, the regulatory framework and the governance models, but there is still this notion that together we can actually achieve more than ind independently. Over the last couple of years, we've seen some very significant investment in ensuring this resilience approach in the GBR particularly. 
The $270 million spent over three years for the Fisheries Structural Adjustment Program, the $375 million over three years to deliver reef water quality, and also updated reef management arrangements for fisheries particularly, I think are a demonstration of government's broader investment into this future. The role of Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service is very much about the field management program in the GBR context. Uh, we jointly fund the program with the Commonwealth, $17 million a year and about 120 staff, which represents uh, the, I guess, the, the tangible face of management in what is a very large and complex area. This notion of re resilience too, we'll see more of that emerge in the context of the Outlook Report, which has been prepared as the first state of parks report, if you like, for the Great Barrier Reef. And it recognises that if, if we can't build greater resilience into the reef environment, that there are outcomes that are far worse um, in, in store for, for the reef. In this graph here, we, we see the natural fluctuation in the overall quality of the reef over the last um, millennia, but in recent times that decline, as demonstrated by the research that we saw yesterday, if we haven't got resilience, the worst case scenario sees a major collapse in those systems, and the best bet that we have is to ensure resilience now so that we can maintain perhaps the reef in what it is now within Pui of what it is now, um, but the chance of actually regaining what it was in pre-damage is, is quite, quite, uh, quite challenging. Can we just give you a, a I'm going back a key. The, the context within which we manage uh, marine environments in Queensland is very broad. Apart from the GBR, which is the, perhaps the most well-known uh, marine park in the world and certainly in Australia, we have other state-managed marine parks as well, about 62,000 square kilometres in state-managed marine parks on the GBR coast, but also here in Moreton Bay, about 3,500 square kilometres and in and around uh, the Great Sandy region, about 6,000 square kilometres and a small dot in the HMAS Brisbane Conservation Park. So overall we're managing about 415,000 square kilometres of marine environment, of which reefs are a, a small geographic component but a vital part in the overall health of that system. A our view is that, um, just going back again, that we need to integrate the way in which lands and waters are managed, that we see islands as being connected by water, not separated by water, that without clean water and healthy reefs there would be no fish, Without fish, there would be no seabirds. Without seabirds, there would be no vegetation on coral caves. And without vegetated coral caves, the whole system has a chance of actually being uh, collapsing rather than self-sustaining. So we see a very broad landscape level approach as being relevant to the future of reefs in, in Queensland. The contribution that we play in delivering that, a number of major tools. Creating marine parks that include a whole series of zones that provide for different levels of use, including a, a linked system of no-take zones which allow nature to prevail in those areas and we've seen how important they are over the last day and a half. The compliance programs we run in partnership with Rabumpa and others to ensure that there are no consumptive uses like fishing that occur in, in, in no-take areas. Also uh, preventing and treating any introduced pests which may well compromise the overall integrity of the ecosystems that are found in the marine environment. Restricting vulnerable species and habitats. I think we've evolved from managing individual species to managing habitats more and more, but there is still a need to manage some of those vulnerable species, like dugong, which have collapsed by 97% in some populations in, in the, uh, the GBR area. We also see a very important role to be played by uh, public education and engagement to ensure that we have protection through partnerships, that we've got to do this thing together. We can't act in isolation. Can I now just go through a few examples of our contribution uh, to achieving those outcomes across Queensland. I might start on our back door here at Moreton Bay. About 2.75 million people live within a stone's throw of Moreton Bay. It is, it is their, their wet background, if you like. And each week, about 1,000 to 1,500 people are coming across the border to settle mostly in this part of the world. So this in intense urban interface with what is a fairly pristine marine environment is an extraordinary challenge but opportunity for us to demonstrate the powers that, that marine parks can contribute uh, in, in terms of securing reef futures in Queensland. With so many people so close to the marine environment in, in Moreton Bay, there's obviously politics involved in that. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've been doing some work to rezone the marine park, and that was the subject of significant public interest and controversy. Uh, we had 8,000 submissions 
on the proposed zoning arrangements for Moreton Bay. It turns out that, that I fish, I vote is quite a catch cry that caught a lot of attention in, in, in the, uh, the political arena. What we found though is that working with good science and working with, with groups such as the Scientific Advisory Committee on which um, the ARC was, was a contributor, that we could lay a mattress, if you like, for the community and for government to recognise that this was worth the heartache. There was science behind the decision to secure and protect parts of Moreton Bay. We recognised early on that our knowledge was incomplete, that we had a fairly good idea of, of the, the values and threats uh, within Moreton Bay proper, but on the outer parts of Moreton Bay, on the eastern side of Moreton Island particularly, um, our map showed only one species lived there, and that species was dragons lived there, because it was quite an unknown part of the world for us in terms of the, the biodiversity and the conservation values. So we spent quite a bit of time and money in, in doing acoustic uh, sonar work and backed up by video uh, photography to ground truth on that material to find out the substrate, the, the different communities that were living there, and that formed very important uh, input in the decision about where green zones and other protection zones we placed, uh, especially in that part of the world. So as a consequence of science, of politics and of community engagement, we're able to make some very informed, defendable and sensible decisions about which parts of Moreton Bay should be protected. Uh, we've increased the amount of green zones from point half of 1% to 16%, which is a significant improvement. And my hope is that in 10 years time, we come back to rezone the area again, that science will show that that has paid huge dividends in terms of the benefits of, of the, the marine environment for people, including the fishing community. We've increased uh, range of numbers, management infrastructure, and I think Moreton Bay is now a better place than it has been uh, ever before. There's two and a half million dollars we're investing in more monitoring to better understand the relationship between our management regime and the conservation status of um, species and communities in the bay. Uh, the good news is that early work has shown that the green zones, even the small green zones, have ensured bigger fish, better fish and more fish, which is great news for fishers and also great news in terms of politicians who are keen to drive the conservation agenda. Uh, I also understand that the mud crabs are bigger and better than ever before, um, but I haven't yet tasted one, but that's perhaps um, some way down the track. That was supposed to be a joke, but uh, no laughs from the, the wrong audience. Okay. Um, we can move now to um, the GBR and, and broader compliance approaches. In the early days, compliance in marine environments was, was categorised as cruising and perusing. I think it's far more complicated and far more professional than that. There's a great deal of insight that goes into guiding our compliance regime. It's about risk-based assessments and where are we going to get the best effect for the limited money we have available. And compliance is more than just issuing tickets to people. And while that is one outcome, prevention is better than a cure. And we have a whole range of, of mechanisms we're using to ensure that people know what the right behaviour is and where to do it, to ensure there is a, a sufficient deterrent value in terms of the chance of being found out and the chance of being prosecuted. Uh, and working across different agencies to actually achieve that outcome is an important part of the solution from our perspective. I think the 2004 rezoning of the marine park was a very powerful tool that uh, tried to establish a whole series of linked refugia to ensure long-term survival of, of different communities. Uh, and the compliance regime is one important plank of actually delivering on that promise of that, uh, that zoning scheme. I can just give you an example of how we believe that that's been successful so far, even though there is room for improvement, that uh, coral trout, as one indicator species, um, the, the average um, density of coral trout in habitat protection zones versus uh, marine national park reef zones and preservation zones, we're seeing that greater protection leads to greater overall biomass, but what we're seeing is that there is still a legal take occurring on those green zones. So for example, this slide, the difference between the, the pink and the green really represents, in part, uh, illegal take. So where we have total exclusion of any use, the, there's about three times the, the biomass of indicator species then on those zones where there's open take. Uh, we're seeing that green zones are, are helpful, but any illegal take there is compromising their overall effectiveness. We've also done some work on assessing the, the risk profile for both land and marine uh, environments. And this just gives you a sense of the 33 island groupings that we have assessed uh, across the, the GBR of the 800. Um, it's identified the critical priority areas and we are targeting our efforts on, on those. Just some very quick examples of that. 
On Rain Island, the nesting habitat has been compromised uh, over the last 15 years, decline in the number of productive uh, turtle hatchlings and trying to build resilience there where the sand levels have, have uh, I think, prevented the, the uh, success rate of many of the, the turtle eggs. Uh, major challenge for us. Um, Pisonia forest defoli defoliation in uh, Capricornia Cays, a similar issues where island hitchhikers and other pests have actually compromised the integrity of those ecosystems and have required significant reinvestment to reduce that. Our approach there was um, once we learnt from the experience on Tryon Island when there was a similar infestation on nearby island to, to get in early, to use science, to control those, uh, those the disease vectors and actually we, we've now had some quite good success in relation uh, to that. Other elements of our approach in terms of Keppel Bay uh, Islands and better control of moorings. The purpose of this approach really is to demonstrate whether or not uh, controlling of, of mooring in reef environments is going to help build resilience for those uh, coral communities in the long term. Uh, it's an early program but it's one attempt for us to actually translate the theory into the practice in terms of these challenges of climate change. A similar story can be told in relation to coastal birds um, that there is serious decline in, in four of the, the major um, bird sites across the GBR. Um, we've got some good news in terms of our better knowledge about coral communities in places like the Great Sandy region. We found 35 coral communities that weren't known uh, 15 years or so ago and we're expecting to find probably uh, 60 different species in that part of the world. And again, engaging with the community has been a very powerful way of gaining better knowledge to guide our management. Our work with the traditional owners is very important in terms of ensuring that any traditional use and take of marine resources is sustainable and also the use of interpretation to provide connection uh, with the community. We can't do it alone. Protection must happen through partnerships and we see that as being an important part of our job. If I can make some just closing comments, our business is all about connecting, connecting people and places, connecting places with places and connecting places over time so that we have some sense of resilience in the long term for these reef and marine environments. But people vote and corals don't, and so it's important for us to build a, a level of support in the broader community. If we are serious about protecting reefs for all people and for all time, we need to put it into context. Bill Bryson wrote a wonderful book, A Brief History of Just About Everything, and he uses the analogy that if this is the age of the Earth, four billion years, if we start here, it's only when you get to my right-hand wrist that we actually start to see simple life emerge from the primordial swamps I think public servants came first and the academics after that. <laughs> then we had some dinosaurs and it's only human existence, 100,000 years of human existence is nothing more than a bit of dust on the edge of my fingertip. With one brush, uh, it's gone. And so we're talking about significant changes in the reef environment over the last 20 years, last 50 years. In the grand scheme of things, if we were about all time, it's, it's just a blink in the eye. If we are serious about the reef being the canary in the mine, and if we think when the canary keels over, we should start to panic and do something serious, I wonder whether, has the canary already fallen off the perch? And if it has, why are we still in the mine? Why haven't we taken it seriously? Ladies and gentlemen, final remark is that Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, we're from the government, we're here to help you, we're part of the solution long term. Have a great day. Thank you. We have time for a question.